because John, you know, I'd forget. Yes, <laughs> hit that record button. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I do see people joining. So um, we're just gonna wait about a minute and then we'll get started. We'll let people have a, a minute or so to, to get on. Sounds good. Time. Could be used to that by now. <laughs> Hi, Kristen. <clears throat> okay, I know some people are still joining, but we're going to get started um, right here at seven. So um, on, beh on behalf of the Epilepsy Foundation of Wisconsin, want to welcome you to tonight's virtual meetup. My name is Alicia Thompson. Um, for those that don't know who I am, I'm the program manager here. Um, we also have John on the call. John, if you want to say hi. Hello, John Mirasola. I work with Alicia with the foundation with communications and client support services. Thank you very much, John. Um, and before we get into our topic and before we get to meet our speaker tonight, um, just a couple of housekeeping things so you guys are all aware. Um, so we are recording this, so you can um, find that up on our website. John will type our website in. Um, if you go underneath the chat button, you can find that there. We have a video library that we, um, we update weekly, so you can find that um, by early next week. You should be able to see it if you want to reference it or point anybody else in the direction of the video. Um, if you're an attendee on this call tonight, please know that you are muted and your videos are off. Um, but we do encourage questions and we'll have time at the end for questions and you can use the Q&A button um, on your screen to go ahead and ask your questions. Feel free to wait till the end or do it throughout. That's just fine. John and I will be uh, monitoring those. So we'll keep an eye, keep an eye on them. Uh, and then just know for the sake of time, we may not get to all questions this evening, but feel free to please um, send us your questions after the fact. John's also going to type in our connect at epilepsywisconsin.org email in the chat. So you can submit questions um, if you need to, if you think about something after the fact or your question didn't get answered, we will get it. Um, we will pass it on and get the answer back to you. Um, I think that's all for housekeeping stuff. So um, very excited. So tonight we are discussing um, the COVID-19 vaccine and epilepsy. Um, and with us tonight, you can see on the screen, we have Dr. Adam Kanai. I said that right? You nailed it. Nice job. Awesome. All right. He's a pediatric neurologist uh, who specializes in epilepsy management at UW American Family Children's Hospital. Um, and he's a clinical assistant professor with the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. So Dr. Kanai, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot, Alicia. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, so I'm Adam Kanai. Um, as a healthcare provider, uh, I feel like everybody kind of asks me questions about COVID-19, even though it's not really within the realm of pediatric epilepsy, but I've become sort of an ad hoc specialist on it and by extension, the, uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, before I share my Screen and kind of go through the PowerPoint that I've uh, got presented. I just want to disclose, um, you know, I have no conflicts of interest and I have no uh, financial disclosures or anything like that. Uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a couple of uh, pretty big pharmaceutical companies tonight, but they are not paying me any money. I am providing free sponsorship for them. Um, if I was making money, I'd have a much more regal background than this, um, but that's pretty much it. So um, let me go ahead and scare, share my screen. And we'll get this going. Alicia and John, is my screen showing okay? Yep, you're good to go. Sounds good. All right. So um, first thing I want to sort of talk about is just the goals of vaccine development. And this is really for any sort of vaccine. So there's really twofold. And really the number one goal is safety. Um, you want to create a vaccine that's safe that people will trust and feel comfortable receiving. Because if you create an, an effective vaccine, 
that has terrible side effects, nobody's going to go get that vaccine. So um, with this COVID-19 vaccine and with all these trials that we're going to talk about, that was really the top priority for the development of these things. Um, then the other goal then is efficacy. So how good is it for infectious diseases? How good is it at preventing disease, meaning symptomatic illness from it? Um, or the other way you can look at it is how good is it at actually preventing infections? So not just symptoms, but from you actually contracting the virus, having it replicate inside you and spreading it to others. And even though you're not having symptoms, so that's sort of looking at asymptomatic disease too, which has been a real problem with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 might be the other thing you hear me call it tonight. Um, with any sort of vaccine development going through FDA approval, it goes through all these phases of development. So there's preclinical and then there's phases one, two, and three. And then the case for some of the ones that are on the market now, they get emergency use authorization or EUA might be the term you hear me talking about. So with these phases, um, just kind of go over how it's sort of done in general, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the ones with the ones that are on market. So the Moderna one and the Pfizer BioNTech one. Um, we have these phases or these phases of development. So preclinical phase, you might hear in the news, um, that's really looking primarily at animal testing. So they want to check and see if it's safe and effective for these guys. In this case, with all these, it was done using mice um, before they move on to clinical trials with humans. So what they do here is they give the vaccine to the animals. They look for side effects, make sure there's nothing horrible or untoward that's happening. And they're also looking for efficacy. So if you give the vaccine, are these little guys creating antibodies, which would theoretically help fight off the virus. Um, and also go ahead and administer the virus too, usually by just injecting it into the animals and seeing if they're able to fight it off and either not develop symptoms or not develop you know, viral expansion itself. If everything looks good there, then what they do is they move on to phase one evaluation, which is looking at healthy humans and usually a very small trial. Um, the reason that they do this with healthy humans is they really don't want any you know, variables that could be attributed to any sort of side effects that would develop. So if people develop problems, they wanna know that it's due to the vaccine itself and not necessarily due to some underlying health condition that they may have had. Usually during phase one, um, trials, they're also trying to figure out, you know, one, is it safe, um, making sure there's no side effects, but also trying to figure out the dosage too. So just like with our epilepsy medications, a lot of times you want to find that sweet spot where it's effective, but it's not causing terrible side effects. So they'll use that um, and figure out a dosage. And if everything is promising from the phase one evaluation, they'll move on to phase two. Phase two is a bigger group of subjects. So usually anywhere from 100 to 1,000 people. Um, and what they want in this case is for the cohort to really reflect the target population that they're planning to release this product to. So that means that we want the demographics to really line up in terms of age, race, gender, and then prevalence of comorbidities, just so that if side effects pop up again, you have it in a small group um, and you can determine whether or not it's safe to kind of move forward with your phase three evaluation which is an even larger population group. So in this case, we're talking thousands to tens of thousands. The AstraZeneca Oxford one in the US is aiming for like 60,000 or something like that. Um, and here it's still similar. We're looking at matched demographics. Um, and then they're also gonna monitor for symptoms, which is, you know, they're either gonna look for symptomatic development um, or they're just actually gonna look for um, actual infection rates without symptoms um, as well. Um, if everything is good there, then they can apply if they want for emergency use authorization or EUA, um, which is what's happened for two products so far, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but that doesn't mean it's done. There's also follow-up studies for all these. Even if they get EUA, they're going to go on and sort of watch these patients for two years afterwards just to make sure that nothing, no long-term side effects uh, develop in these populations. So that's kind of the phase development. So for the, the COVID-19 vaccines um, on the market right now, they all kind of do the same thing. You may hear this and you've probably seen a billion pictures and cartoons of the coronavirus, um, but the coronaviruses all work in a similar fashion in the sense that they have these things called spikes. You may also hear them called S proteins or S peptides. This uh, picture on the left is an electron mic uh, microscope picture of the coronavirus. This is just a little cartoon on the right. I mean, inside the virus, it has genetic material, including some genetic material that encodes specifically for that spike protein. And that spike protein is really important for coronavirus because it's what helps it bind to your cells once it's inside your body 
and actually inject this uh, genetic material inside your cells and replicate and create an infection. Um, the F protein work uh, with a lot of these, what they've done is sort of work backwards and determine what that genetic code is that encodes for that protein and then use that to create a vaccine. So typically this is a really tough step uh, to figure out, it takes years of trial and error. Uh, but these new vaccines were built using data from the early 2000s with the SARS outbreak, which was kind of your OG SARS-CoV. Um, right now we're sort of dealing with the sequel. Um, and then also uh, with the 2012 uh, MERS outbreak for the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, which both of these were coronaviruses as well, just a little bit different from the one that we're dealing with at this time. So one of the reasons that the vaccines this time around kind of were developed so quickly relative to vaccines in the past, which usually take years, is that they've sort of been in development for, for years already, just looking at um, those past outbreaks and somewhat anticipating that this may have happened. So with the ones that are on the, the market now, the Pfizer BioNTech and the Moderna vaccines, these are a new type of vaccines that haven't been released before. Um, so these vaccines are called mRNA vaccines or messenger RNA vaccines. Um, what they do is they use messenger RNA, which is this genetic material that our cells read to make proteins. Um, and what these are, are the very fragile proteins that, you know, typically would be kind of chopped to pieces by enzymes in our body where they to be introduced. Um, so what they've done in this case um, is uh, protect it with this little oily bubble or this phospholipid bilayer um, that uh, kind of acts as a transport molecule so that once it's injected inside you, it can kind of float around and not break down until it actually fuses with your host cells to create an immune reaction. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about that fragility in a little bit. Um, but here, just on this page, is just a little schematic of how this would work. Um, so you have your lipid bilayer with your, your vaccine and mRNA here. It's injected. Um, and once it's injected, it'll sort of bump into cells inside your body and fuse with them and then release that little RNA, RNA molecule. Um, and then once that happens, it'll interact with um, little proteins inside your cells. So specifically, these things called ribosomes take that mRNA and start building these little spike proteins. Um, so little fragments of the spike proteins and then the spikes themselves. Some of these are produced from the cell um, and they form spikes that will migrate to the surface and they'll kind of stick out on the tips of the cells down here. Um, these will then um, eventually the, the mRNA here because it's so fragile will actually just get broken down. So it doesn't really leave any trace of being inside the body. Um, the vaccinated cells will then also sort of break up some of these proteins and fragments and present these on the surface as well. So you have the spikes as well as the little fragments. And then these will go ahead and sort of get recognized by the immune system and cause some activation. I think what's really important to point out here is that we're just injecting a little piece of the, the genetic code for the virus. We're not actually injecting the virus and we're not injecting the entire genetic code for the virus. So you can't get COVID-19 from these vaccines. Um, that spike is kind of it's a unique part of the virus. It's almost like the hood ornament of a luxury car. So like if you had a piece of like a hood ornament from a Mercedes show up in your mailbox, you know what it came from, but you'd also know that you don't have like a whole Mercedes like sitting in your front yard or anything like that. Um, because this isn't wrapped inside a different virus too, theoretically, it's supposed to be less uh, less effective in terms of causing side effects. It's going to create not as strong of an immune response. Um, it's also thought that this mRNA technology is a little bit quicker to develop too compared to traditional vaccines as well. So these are some advantages to it. Um, so those are the two that are on the market now. And then the other two that are probably coming very soon are these adenovirus-based vaccines. Um, these are coming from Johnson & Johnson and then AstraZeneca Oxford. So these vaccines um, are also kind of based on the virus's genetic instructions for building that spike protein. Unlike the other ones, the Pfizer and Moderna ones, um, which store the instructions on that single-stranded RNA, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the AstraZeneca ones will do it on double-stranded DNA. So this little stuff in here. Um, what they've done is they've added the gene for the coronavirus spike. So same kind of genetic instructions, um, but they've added to these viruses called adenoviruses. Um, adenoviruses are really common viruses that are throughout the community. Typically they cause just very common cold, um, very mild symptoms usually. 
Um, and what they've done uh, at both companies is they created these modified adenoviruses, which are able to actually go ahead and enter your cells. But once they're in, like uh, typical viruses, they can't replicate and expand. They can only just kind of dump off this genetic material. Um, these, um, while relatively new, have been researched for quite some time as well. Um, the first adenovirus-based vaccine was actually just released back in July, and that was for the Ebola virus, and that was made by Johnson & Johnson, too. Um, they're also running trials using adenovirus-based vaccines for other viruses, um, including HIV and Zika virus. Um, those are not out on the market yet. Um, the only difference between these two, um, in terms of the types of viruses they're using, is Johnson & Johnson using this adenovirus called adenovirus 26. Um, AstraZeneca is using actually chimpanzee adenovirus. Um, the advantage to these is that they're a little more rugged than those mRNA vaccines um, from Pfizer and Moderna. So the DNA is not as fragile as uh, RNA is. And then it also comes in this really tough protein coat instead of this you know, lipid bilayer. Um, that keeps it from breaking down. Um, so as a result, these vaccines don't need to be stored at such cool temperatures to remain stable. They can actually just be in your fridge um, and they can usually last up to several months um, without um, you know, any, losing any efficacy. So in this case, what happens is once, the, you, know, once you get to your injection, you get to the adenovirus-based vaccine, they're going to float around in your extracellular space, eventually bump into your cells, um, and they're going to latch on to proteins on the surface. And what happens is your cell will read that signal and actually engulf the virus um, and pull it inside. Once it's in that bubble, and it'll actually pop out of that bubble and fuse with this little organelle inside your, your cell called your nucleus. Um, and there, um, the, the DNA will go in. Um, and then it's engineered, so it can't make copies of itself, but the gene for the coronavirus spike is then translated into mRNA, which is really what was happening with the other virus too. You get that mRNA and you get a very similar process um, in terms of eliciting an immune response as well. So the big takeaway between these two vaccine types is that you use different methods to get your cells to build those spike proteins and activate the immune response. Um, the adenovirus also will provoke your immune system by switching on, you know, these cell alarm systems that'll send out a warning signal, activate immune cells nearby, um, and cause it to react a little more strongly to the spike proteins just because it is associated with that adenovirus, which most of our immune systems have seen before. So once you've got that mRNA making those spike proteins, you have uh, immune system evac or activation happening in a couple different ways. So the cells in our bodies are, are kind of constantly kind of dying and regenerating. So when vaccinated cells um, die, they will go ahead and release um, little proteins and the spike proteins and the spikes themselves will kind of float around. And then they will usually get to be taken up by these things called antigen presenting cells, which is this big kind of beige ugly guy right here. So these go by a lot of different names. They're called B cells or lymphocytes. There's also macrophages or, dendrit or dendritic cells. Really their job is to just take these little, these proteins or these little spikes um, and just present them on their surface. Um, when they do that, then they got these other uh, types of immune cells called helper T cells. They'll go around and actually detect these and kind of bind and create this immune response, releasing these things called cytokines, which do all kinds of things. They create inflammation inside our body. So when this happens, Sometimes we'll feel not so great. We'll have a little bit of a fever or a little bit of fatigue or malaise or feel kind of achy. But that cytokine release will also lead to activation of all these other different types of immune system cells and kind of create this immune response. Um, the key thing it does is it leads to proliferation of B cells, um, which will then mature and differentiate in these things called plasma cells, which will go ahead and create antibodies against that spike protein. Uh, um, so with immune system activation, the B cells I was talking about will go around and sort of grab these spikes that are floating around too. So here's a B cell um, I was talking about. Um, they um, will then go ahead and bump in or cause these free floating spike proteins to, uh, to bind. And a few of them may be able to lock on. They are then activated by helper T cells and they create those antibodies that specifically target these uh, spike proteins that are associated specifically with coronaviruses. 
Antibiotics will then float around. They'll latch onto coronavirus spikes if there's any in your system. Um, and that does a couple of things. It sort of activates other immune system cells to come on over and destroy this virus. It also keeps that virus from binding onto other cells in your body. Imagine these little spikes are kind of like hands that sort of grab the doors that go into your cells. Um, they can't do that if they got antibodies bound to them, which are just specific types of proteins that are aiming for this uh, spike. So those are a couple of ways that that works out. Um, and the cells that are usually activated to come destroy things are these things called killer T cells, um, which will sort of destroy any sort of coronavirus infected cells. So not vaccinated cells, but infected cells later on because this, this takes a little time to develop. Um, so that is that. That's kind of in a nutshell how these vaccines work. Um, now with these phase trials, the Moderna and the, the Pfizer ones, fairly similar setup to their studies. So what they did um, was they administered doses. So they took these groups. So Moderna had about 30,000 participants um, and they broke them up either into a placebo group or a vaccine group. With that uh, placebo group, um, they usually got like a saline injection or something very benign. And so these were administered at day zero of the study or the first day of the study. And then four weeks later, a second dose was given. Anybody who became symptomatic after day 42, so two weeks after that second dose, um, ended up getting tested for the coronavirus. So what they were looking for in this trial was symptomatic disease, not necessarily just infection. So they weren't really looking for asymptomatic carriers or anything like that. Just does this prevent uh, symptomatic disease? Um, because this is an mRNA one, it's got to be stored at cooler temperatures. So it's got to be minus four. So it could have been kept outside um, on our front steps the last couple of weeks, I feel like, but now it'll be a no-go. Um, and Moderna is suspected they're going to be able to create like a billion doses of this by the end of 2021. Now, the big thing here is that in these cases, for people who developed uh, symptoms in the placebo group is 185 people and the vaccine group, 11 people. And then of those people, um, severe cases, 30 in the placebo group, um, zero in the vaccine group, which is pretty impressive. And that's what you'll see in news articles or, or reports on TV is that the Moderna one is 95% effective against symptomatic disease. That's based on these numbers right here, 100% effective against severe cases because nobody develops severe cases in this trial. Pfizer, very similar. Um, what they ended up doing was administering a little bit of a shorter interval. So that day zero and day 21, um, if you got symptomatic after day 28 instead of day 42, you got tested. So they're still looking for symptomatic disease. Um, the Pfizer vaccine is much more dainty. So it's gotta be stored at minus 94 Fahrenheit uh, or minus 70 Celsius, which is often not feasible for underserved areas or rural medical centers, just in terms of having that storage on site and being able to facilitate transport of the vaccine out there. Um, so it's, that's a huge hurdle for this one. Um, Pfizer does think they're gonna make 1.3 billion doses at the end of 2021. Um, similarly, their study, they had 43,000 in there, um, 162 in the placebo uh, group developed symptoms. Nine of those were severe cases, which is eight symptomatic in the vaccine group and one severe case in the vaccine group. So you'll get numbers here that is 95% effective against symptomatic disease. And then it's like 87.5% effective against uh, severe cases, meaning hospitalizations usually. Um, so very similar, very impressive for vaccines. 95% effective or efficacy is really good. The other one then uh, that was kind of talked about a lot early on, uh, like back in December, was the AstraZeneca or Oxford University uh, vaccine. So remember, this is the adenoviral um, vaccine. So this, like the Moderna one, you gave something at day zero, day 28. In this case, the control group, they used actually a meningococcal vaccine, um, which is you know to fight a bacterial infection that a lot of people get. Um, so they use that just to kind of you make it as similar as possible to getting an actual vaccine with in terms of you know the side effects that we may get from vaccines like fever chills malaise stuff like that um so they did day zero and they gave something benign at day 28. in this case they um, tested everybody in their group at day 42 for coronavirus not just people who had symptoms so they were looking for efficacy against infection not necessarily efficacy against symptomatic illness um, so that's why their numbers are gonna look a little bit different from the other two. 
Um, because it's in that adenoviral package, it's much more robust. So again, it just has to be kept at 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, the weather today pretty much. Um, and they project that they're going to make anywhere from three to 4.5 billion doses at the end of 2021. And I'll talk a little bit about why this is such a variable number. Um, it kind of comes from this little hiccup that happened. So they've, they've kind of tested this around the world and they had a cohort in Brazil. They had a cohort in the UK as well. What happened in the UK cohort is uh, by some error, they ended up giving only half the vaccine to the vaccine group on the first day. So they got half a dose on the first day and a full dose on day 28. Whereas in Brazil and, and pretty much trials everywhere else, you know, you got a full dose on day zero and a full dose at day 28. Um, curiously, in Brazil, 62% effective at preventing infection. So they got more of the vaccine, lower rate, whereas UK, 90% uh, effective. So not an expected outcome. Um, there's still kind of looking into why this may have been, you know, was it because of different variants in the area? Was there just higher um, infectious rates overall? But overall, with these two cohorts together, you know, it was about 12,000 people, um, 131 people uh, tested positive for it, meaning that it's 70% uh, effective at preventing infection. Um, but of those 131, zero people developed severe illness. So it comes away with this number of 100% effective against severe infections. Um, which is interesting. So if they go on to figure out that like you could go ahead and give half a dose on that first one and then a full dose later on, that would be where you get this 4.5 billion because you just create more vaccines, lower volumes, which would be really good. Um, if you're watching the news pretty much this morning, they started talking a lot about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, which is applying for emergency use authorization now. I got to go back. AstraZeneca has not applied for EUA and in the US yet. It's being administered across the European Union and a lot of Latin American countries, but not here in the country yet. I think the latest I heard is that it may apply for EUA in April. So Johnson Johnson is going for it now. The big advantage to Johnson Johnson's vaccine is that it's a single dose vaccination. You don't have to come back for a second shot. Um, also, because it's adenoviral, it can be kept in the fridge. The numbers from this are showing that it's 66% effective at preventing um, disease, so symptomatic illness, which doesn't sound so hot. Um, they also tested uh, a much wider range. They did it throughout the US and Latin America, South Africa, um, where some more problematic variants are arising at this point. So it's thought that maybe it was a little bit of a disadvantage in terms of the time that it was being tested at. What's really promising though is that in the US, it's showing similar efficacy numbers um, compared to the, as those mRNA vaccines, which is good. And again, it's coming out with this, this number of 100% efficacy against hospitalizations and deaths in the US cohort so far. Um, Johnson Johnson is thinking that they're going to have uh, 100 million doses available by the end of June. So hopefully with all these companies combined, we should be fairly well covered. Um, I think the big question is, you know, talking about all these products, should you be a vaccine snob and, and decline one vaccine in favor of another? Um, really with the efficacy numbers, um, there's not much of a difference between all these products. So whatever you can get, I would go for. I think the only more logistic uh, convenience for, for everybody would be, you know, with the Johnson Johnson one, you only need one shot. Um, but again, that's not been authorized yet. They're applying for it now. It'll likely come on the market fairly soon. So um, side effects um, should be, that's what a lot of people are wondering about. So most of these have been mild or minimal. So they're kind of the, the side effects you'd expect with any sort of vaccine. So pain and redness at the injection site, fatigue, headaches, motor muscles and joint pain. Um, those are fairly common, like probably about a third of patients will have some, some complaint of one of those things. Um, severe reaction, so an anaphylactic reaction or a severe allergic reaction is being reported, but it's crazy rare. So the number that's coming out is that for every million people who get it, about 11 will have a strong allergic reaction to it. Um, this is kind of based on the first week of vaccination with the Pfizer one. So that was in the middle of December um, in this country. So what happened there was um, about 1.9 million people were vaccinated. Um, 
And through that, um, I think the number, yeah, 21 people um, ended up having a severe allergic reaction. Um, for those people that did develop a severe reaction, uh, allergic reaction, uh, over 70% of them developed that within the first 15 minutes. So that's why when you go and get your vaccine, you'll be asked to kind of hang around for about 15 minutes just to make sure that you don't develop a reaction. And in case you do, you know, you can have first aid administered um, or, you know, help called for just so that you're not on your own. Um, again, this is a very low risk rate. This is much lower than your risk of being struck by lightning, um, but it is something that people should be aware of. Um, speaking of the allergies, so any sort of severe allergic reaction to any vaccine or injectable, or injectable therapy, so that's you know any sort of IM medications, um, any sort of IV medications or subcutaneous medications in the past, you should be careful with getting the vaccine, but it's not a contraindication to getting this vaccine. You can still get it. Um, really though, if you have a history of anaphylaxis, you're going to probably be observed for a longer period of time after you get that shot. The recommendations right now are about 30 minutes, um, just to make sure that you still tolerate it okay. But it's not a contraindication to getting the shot. You're still eligible to get it. Um, the other thing that people wonder a lot about is, you know, this, these vaccines came out very quickly compared to vaccines in the past. And that's really just because this is a global pandemic. Um, there's a lot more urgency to this. There's a lot more resources dumped into developing these vaccines than you know, had been done in the past. Every study, every phase of every trial was carefully reviewed um, and approved by a safety board at the FSA. And the process was transparent, rigorous throughout, and there was continual oversight by expert approval throughout for all of these companies and their trials. And what's, what's kind of reassuring for everybody is that we're going to continue to gather data um, over the next couple of years for these, these vaccine participants and make sure that there are no long-term side effects, um, that everybody kind of stays safe. Overall, you know, getting vaccinated is going to keep you, your family, and your community healthy and safe. 95 efficacy is really promising. Um, and the goal is, you know, if we can get as many people vaccinated as possible, we can end the damage to, you know, our economy that this has caused, prevent more illnesses and death, more importantly, in this country and then eliminate and eradicate COVID-19, hopefully. Um, the long-term effects though, um, there's not much known um, just because we are doing EUA and everything was somewhat rushed out here for good reason, um, but we can't really weigh in and say at this time what the risks are um, down the road, which typically in the past, you know, you'd have your phase three trial and it would kind of go on for years and years just to make sure that there were no issues. So that's where I was talking about that two years of monitoring that's still underway right now. And if there's any um, problems that arise from this, um, it'll be sort of dealt with accordingly. So what I pulled up here is actually from the Wisconsin uh, Department of Health Services um, vaccination dashboard. So it's similar to their COVID-19 dashboard. I actually pulled this up uh, just this morning and put it in here. Um, just to show a couple of things. It's, it's a neat tool to just see how the state is doing in terms of vaccinating everybody. So over here on the left, we have you know, our state broken down by county. Um, darker color means more, more a higher percentage of the population that county has been vaccinated. Lighter means not doing so hot. Um, I have a set for just people who've gotten one vaccine so far, not two vaccines. So when you see that 14.2, which is honestly probably closer to 15% now, um, that is so far. Um, I think for two, it's probably closer to 7% at this point. What I wanted to point out is that right now we're working on getting everybody 65 and older vaccinated. And we're at this point, probably over halfway done. Um, so this morning is 48.1%. We're doing a pretty good job. We're getting 200,000 people vaccinated in the state every week on average, if you look at this group down here. Right now, um, People who can get the COVID-19 vaccine in this state um, include frontline healthcare personnel, people in skilled nursing and long-term care facilities, uh, fire and police personnel, correctional uh, staff, and then, as I said, people 65 and over. Um, that 65 and over group, there's about a million people in Wisconsin who are over the age of 65. Um, so it's taking a little bit of time getting through that, but the next eligible populations are on their way. That's phase 1C of this vaccine rollout, which is going to be starting on March 1st here in Wisconsin. Um, highest priority in that group is going to be education and child care providers. So this includes um, everybody in private and public school programs, virtual learning support, community learning center programs, 
uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, YMCA, Head Start, and even higher education if they're having uh, direct contact with students. So the goal or the expectation is that March and April is really going to be focused on and getting this population uh, vaccinated as well as catching up with anybody in the, uh, the currently eligible group that hasn't been vaccinated yet. Other groups then in March 1st that are going to be able to be eligible for these are going to be people who are enrolled in Medicaid long-term care programs, um, some public-facing essential workers, including like 911 operators, people who work in public transit, people who work in the food supply train, or chain or utility and communications infrastructure. The goal is really to focus on this, this population in April and May getting their vaccinations. Um, non frontline essential health care personnel, so people who are kind of healthcare adjacent in their jobs, and then people who are living in congregate living facilities. Um, so that would be um, employer-based housing, shelters, um, housing that serves the elderly or people with disabilities, people who are in transitional housing, and incarcerated individuals. And again, this is going to be geared towards the April and May. And then hopefully after May, we spread it, we open it up to the general population more so with phase two. So how does this all really relate to epilepsy? Um, so, uh, you know, a couple of things, you know, epilepsy is, is a very variable diagnosis. It's kind of a family of many different disorders that lead to seizures. So some people have very easily controlled seizures. They don't really have any other health problems and they become seizure free on medication or they might have epilepsy with occasional seizures but they don't really have any other health problems. So for this, this group of people, the available data suggests that just having epilepsy alone doesn't increase uh, your risk for getting COVID-19 and doesn't increase the severity of COVID-19 where you to contract it. Um, there's no evidence that people with epilepsy alone have a weakened immune system, meaning that you shouldn't be considered epilepsies or different causes of epilepsies or other health conditions that may have factors that do affect their immunity. So what are those? Um, this could be a couple of things. So medications is, is one issue to consider. So there are some medicines that, you know, control seizures that also affect the immune system. You know, as a pediatric epileptologist, we use ACTH um, and steroids for things like infantile spasms um, or everolimus for, for patients with tuberous sclerosis complex. There's also immunotherapies as well, which I'll talk about in a second too. These can all kind of decrease your immune system and put you at greater risk for you know, COVID-19 infection or COVID-19 severe illness were you to get it. Um, it's important to note though that most anti-seizure medications don't affect immunity. Um, it's really the ones I listed are kind of the only ones that do. Um, other things to consider then, you know, people with epilepsy may have other medical problems that may place them at higher risk for developing more severe illnesses um, with COVID-19. We consider, you know, patients that have problems swallowing or frequently inhale food or liquid in their lungs, aka aspiration risk. They're at higher risk for pneumonia, therefore they're at higher risk for severe respiratory illness from COVID-19. Um, people with diabetes and underlying heart or lung problems, in addition to their epilepsy diagnoses, can be issues as well. And also patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In our pediatrics population, there has been some data to show that um, you know, kids with epileptic encephalopathies, things like lennox gastaut syndrome, um, are at a little bit of a higher risk compared to the general pop pediatric population for having severe illness if they were to catch uh, COVID-19. Um, regardless of the situation, it's really important that anybody with epilepsy or discuss with their, their treating healthcare provider about their individual risks and whether any specific medical precautions are needed. In general, though, anybody, you know, listening to this, whether they have epilepsy or not, Really should just take basic precautions to avoid getting sick as well. Uh, talking about kids real quick. So kids between the ages of one and 20, they do get coronavirus or COVID-19. They tend to get milder forms. So it's thought that since it's milder illnesses, they're less likely to, to transmit it, but they're still at a risk for transmitting it. Um, there is a small group though that, that do develop serious disease. So I did already talk about the intellectual and, and developmental disability cohort. Um, infants are also at higher risk. So children under the age of one year old, and that's probably because they have immature immune systems um, that are just sort of developing. So they're more prone to getting very sick from this. And we've, we've seen this unfortunately. Um, 
being young does not protect against or you know you getting or transmitting COVID-19. That's that's kind of the big takeaway. But the risk of death is lower compared to the general population overall. Now there is autoimmune epilepsy. So some types of epilepsies are caused by this change in the body's immune function, um, which are called autoimmune epilepsies. So, you know, your immune system, as we've talked about, is this critical part of the body that helps you fight. Um, the other the other thing or the other advantage to waiting, you know, that 90 days is that you're going to decrease your risk for side effects from the vaccine because um, you won't have such a overwhelming immune response to it. Other populations um, that are kind of popping up as a question um, include, um, you know, people who are pregnant or trying to become pregnant. So unfortunately, with the trials already, you know, vaccines under emergency use authorization um, weren't tested and in, in, pregnant patients or lactating women. So there's no safety data specific to use in pregnancy that's available right now. It's presumed to be low risk just because, you know, virus or vaccines are, are given during pregnancy. But if you're considering it, you should discuss it with your primary care doctor or your OB guy. And if you find yourself in that situation, um, what's important is that being pregnant or breastfeeding is not a, a, a preclusion from getting the vaccine itself. And then the other term that kind of pops up a lot is herd immunity. Um, so this, or community herd immunity, I guess is the other term that you'll hear, um, but it's basically a term to describe when enough people have protection, either from vaccination or from previous infections so that there are so few susceptible people in the community that it's unlikely that a virus or a bacteria can like continue to spread widely and infect other people. So as a result, everyone within the community is protected, even if some people do not have any protection themselves. Um, and that's really the goal, because going back here, going way back here, I just want to point out this. So this is supposed to be a schematic re representing the entire population of Wisconsin. This gray bar is actually everybody under the age of 16 who's not approved to get this vaccine yet. Um, so there's still, even if everybody does get vaccinated, there's gonna be a cohort of people who are not vaccinated. Um, there are trials underway looking at younger patients as well, um, but right now it's not recommended that anybody under the age of 16 get this shot. Um, so 
the percentage of people who would need to have this protection um, or this herd immunity kind of varies by disease. And at this time, we don't really know what the percentage of people needed to get vaccinated to achieve herd immunity against COVID-19 is. But, you know, recent kind of educated estimates are that at least 75% of the population within the community needs to get immunity before we begin controlling this pandemic. So we still got a ways to go with this. So keeping that in mind, then things you got to do to kind of get back to quote unquote normal is that, you know, while we learn about the protection that these vaccines provide under real life conditions, it's still really important that everybody continue using the tools that we have available to us to help keep this pandemic as much under control as possible. So that's things like covering your mouth and nose with a mask, um, frequent hand washing, staying at least six feet away from others, all that stuff that's listed in the CDC website also is in the Wisconsin um, Department of Health Services website as well. Um, together though, you know, COVID-19 vaccination and following these recommendations for how to protect yourself and others, it's gonna offer the best protection from getting and spreading this virus. Um, we need a little bit more time to kind of understand more about the protections the vaccines provide before there's any like major policy changes on a statewide level or a federal level um, regarding infection control recommendations. But other factors, including like how many people get vaccinated and how the virus is spreading in the communities can um, affect this decision and hopefully move things along well if we do a pretty good job at it. So where to sign up if you're thinking about this. So if you are eligible, if it is your turn to go, um, depending on your local public health, health department, so your county public health department, you may be able to register with them and be notified. Um, other things you can do is just contact your local health care provider. Some health departments also have their own masks and list of providers. Um, and you can also sign up for the weekly COVID-19 newsletter, which is available through the uh, Department of Health Services in Wisconsin, if you just go to their website. If you need further information, calling 211 is always helpful, uh, really for anything. You can also email specifically this, this email website, which is dhscovidvaccinepublic at dhs.wisconsin.gov with any questions or concerns. Um, and then also that, that website is, is a great resource for a lot of different information, not just about vaccines. Um, the other thing um, that I think is really important to do right now is especially with that phase two workout or that rollout, when this vaccine is available to the general public, um, pharmacies are gonna be pretty huge vendors of this. Um, and if we know anything from our neighbors to the South, a lot of people are having luck getting appointments with like Walgreens or CVS in Illinois, where people are already able to get the vaccine under the age of 65. Um, the key to kind of getting those appointments is to have actual accounts with them. So when you go to the Walgreens website or the CVS website, you can, uh, you can see that, you know, log in with your account or create an account option. If you have an account, you have an easier time and a quicker time getting appointments uh, for your coronavirus vaccine. Um, right now, it seems almost comparable to like people trying to get tickets to a hot concert or something like that. You, you got to have a fast internet connection. You got to be on at the right time. Um, you got to be able to click very fast because they're filling up very quickly right now. But that is that is just a little pro tip for you know how to get your vaccine sooner rather than later if you're anxious for it. Open up the uh, floor to any questions um, and kind of go from there. Well, terrific. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Kanai. Very, very nice. Pretty appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions here. <clears throat> um, let's see here. First question has come in. I've already had COVID and I've already recovered. Should I still get the vaccine? So you should. Um, so kind of going back to that one question of people kind of getting reinfected. Um, if you've recently had it, go ahead and wait that 90 day period um, before getting it. So 90 days after you recovered, just because right now we don't know if just having one infection affords you the antibodies to have ongoing immunity from it, especially, you know, with people who caught this really early in the pandemic. So in March and April of last year, um, a lot, not a lot, but a number of them were getting reinfected, you know, in the fall. So at some point, it seems like that antibody response from the infection itself does run out. So general rule of thumb is after you've had an infection, wait, you know, about 90 days, um, at a minimum 30 days, um, but you can still go ahead and get your vaccine. 
Okay, terrific. Um, another one that came in here is someone with epilepsy at a greater risk for side effects or more severe side effects. So there, there has not been any data to show that um, you know having epilepsy alone puts you at greater risk for side effects. Really, the biggest thing that seems to, to pose a risk for side effects is if you've had an anaphylactic or a severe allergic reaction to another vaccine or another type of um, any sort of an injectable medication, whether that's an intramuscular medication or an IV medication or a subcutaneous medication. And so for those people, it's not a contraindication to getting the shot, but just needs to be a little more careful, probably be observed a little more longer. So that 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes where you to get your vaccine. Okay. Um, let's see here, what's coming in. Um, Hamilton says, what is the better way to treat the shot site, heat or cold? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't have a great scientific answer for that. I think whatever feels good and works good for you. So, um, I can tell you personally, so I got the Pfizer BioNTech um, vaccine. Um, the first shot I felt okay. Um, the night before I went to bed, I took a little bit of Tylenol just because I felt like maybe I was getting a little warm. Um, but the next morning, the only thing I noticed was that I was a little tired, which I didn't really think much of. I just thought I was tired because I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old and I've been stuck with them inside this house for the last three months. Um, but um, then I talked to my sister who's a social worker in her hospital and she actually said it was the best like two nights of sleep she got because she had a little bit of fatigue from it as well. Um, so they're just my recommendations for this though is, you know, after you get your shot, you can't take Tylenol, you can't take Motrin um, to kind of minimize any side effects, those mild side effects that we get. Um, it is recommended that you don't take it prophylactically before you get your shots. So don't take anything before the shots, just wait until after you get it and go from there. And then, yeah, you gotta, you gotta kind of, you know, experiment a little bit and find what works for you, hot or cold. Um, either one is fine to try. And then it might set you up for success with the second shot if you get one of those two shot vaccines. Okay. And this shouldn't interrupt your regular medicine uh, cycle for, for epilepsy either, correct? Nope. Uh -uh. You go ahead and continue taking your medications as you normally would. This shouldn't uh, change that at all. Okay. Um, let's see here. Could you possibly just elaborate a little bit more on the rollout in Wisconsin? Rollout of the vaccine. Yeah. So um, right now, I mean, this is, and this is still, this is the plan. It's not you know, 100% at this point, but right now the only date that they're providing is that March 1st, that group, those groups of people that we sort of talked about. So um, adjacent healthcare workers, people living in, you know, combined uh, living facilities, um, teachers and childcare workers, all of them, will just suddenly become eligible. Now, hopefully with more production from Pfizer and from Moderna, and availability from Johnson and Johnson, and then maybe AstraZeneca in April, there'll be more vaccine available for everybody. Um, but the places to get those are kind of going to vary county by county. So that's why you know reaching out to your county health department um, and seeing if you're eligible will be uh, reasonable, um, or if you find good options for that. And then pharmacies are going to be available vendors for that too, um, which is why we talk about that Walgreens and CVS, especially just because they're, they're kind of the big ones um, to see if you can get your vaccine there um, or your primary care provider may be able to provide some guidance as well. Beyond that, it's not totally clear when they're going to go to phase two. So right now we've done phase 1A, which is all the healthcare workers. We've done phase 1B, which is you know, the other people, you know, people over 65 um, in correctional facilities or, or police department and fire personnel. Um, and then the phase 1C is happening in March. When does phase two happen and how that looks like? It's still sort of being ironed out, but it seems like it's going to mirror like what was made at the federal recommendations, which is basically opening it up to the general public. Um, the timing of that is really going to depend heavily on how much we can get, like how quickly we can get everybody in this next phase vaccinated and ready to go. So that means, you know, with them aiming for everybody to get their shots, you know, March, April, and May, hopefully in June, we start seeing this phase two roll out and that kind of opens up to everybody. How that looks, is it just going to be a free for all where everybody gets, you know, priority and it just depends on who's you know, getting in quicker compared to other people, or is this still going to be tiered like it has been in the phase one group, 
um, hasn't really been official yet, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, we're going to have to sort of wait and see, I think. Okay. Let's see here. Another one that came in. Um, I live in a senior housing facility and I, will I be able to get the shot in March or April timeframe? You will be eligible in March um, for it based on that. Um, the time frame expected, you know, if they're they're prioritizing, unfortunately, in this group, they're not unfortunately, but they're they're prioritizing healthcare, uh, childcare providers, and then uh, educators. So, in that group, they're probably going to get priority first. So they're going to be the ones getting their shots March and April, and then everybody else in the group, including you know, living in a you know combined living facility like that, will be next priority. So more April and May likely, unless things move along really well in March. Okay. Um, there's one more here. Do you have a recommendation once I become el eligible as a place to start? <clears throat> yeah. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it, it, I was lucky. It was just sort of a given to me. <laughs> like I just was told to come in and get it. Um, how it's going to look for everybody when you become eligible, especially in that phase two rollout, it's going to be tricky. So Keep looking, and I think that's why signing up for that COVID-19 newsletter through the, the Department of Health Services in Wisconsin will be helpful because weekly you'll get an update with like, here's what to do, here's what's going to become available, here's who's going to be able to get it. Um, but I think right now, you know, just knowing your local county health department, their contact information, um, you can check in with your PCP, but honestly, they're probably not going to be able to tell you much right now, um, especially if you're not eligible. Um, and then, you know, signing up for those, those pharmacy websites are key. So I, I'm just talking about that, those pharmacy websites just because I just got, both my parents are 64 in Illinois, um, and we just got them both their, their, their vaccines. Like, they're both like an hour away from where they live, but at least it's somewhere um, where they can just drive around there and get their vaccinations. And it was really just because my sister um, was kind of quick to the draw and, and able to get them signed up and knew sort of at what time they're releasing more time slots, which said they filled up crazy fast, but having an account with, you know, Walgreens or CVS is helpful. Okay. I'm guessing also that 211 number is always a good place to start too. Yep. Yep. Or that email address too. Let's pick up your phone dial 211 or the email mm -hmm. address that you put down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I'm not seeing anything else come in right now. Um, I think we're going to end there. It's almost eight o'clock. And so for all those listening, I am putting once again in our email, if you think of a question later on tonight or any other time this week, um, I'm putting in the chat box, the email that you can use if you think of another question and if you would like it answered, you can send your question to the email connect at epilepsywisconsin.org. That's in your chat box right now. And we can send those to Dr. Kanai and get an answer back to you. Uh, we just ask that you be a little patient to through that process as it won't be live like this. So, all right, Will, Dr. Can I thank you again? That was a terrific presentation, very, very helpful. Thanks, and thanks for joining everybody. Oh, absolutely. We're gonna end our program there. Good night, all everyone. Right. Good night.